Okay, good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Economic Democracy Initiative Climate Teaching. Uh, my name is Pavlina Chernova. I direct the EDI program at the Open Society University Networks and today I'm especially pleased to welcome my colleague and friend Ivan Gutstein. Um, he is the director of the Center for Environmental Policy at Bard College as well as the director and faculty at the Bard MBA program, which is ranked number one uh, green MBA in the country by the Princeton Review. Now, Iban has been sounding the alarm on the climate crisis well before Climate Fridays, well before Sunrise Movement or the Green New Deal. Um, in fact, I believe the first time that we met was during one of your first teachings, either in the late 90s or in the early 2000s. Um, but he has been uh, writing, speaking, organizing around climate issues for decades. He's widely published, uh, including a textbook, uh, now in the seventh edition, Economics and the Environment. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to his other book, um, Trade-Off Myths, Fact and Fiction About Jobs and the Environment. And his most recent book is Fighting for Love in the Century of Extinction, how passion and politics can stop global warming. Now, Earth Day is upon us. It's just in a couple of days. So today I'm especially pleased to um, introduce him with a talk on climate solutions as industrial policy. Welcome, Iban. Thank you, Pavlina. Great, well, um, thanks for uh, the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about um, climate change uh, through the context of the, really a changed policy landscape um, and uh, the marriage of, of, of climate policy and industrial policy. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off with, uh, boringly, with a definition because most people may not be familiar with the idea of industrial policy. What does that mean? Well. Uh, it's any type of intervention or government policy that attempts to improve the business environment or to alter the structure of economic activity towards sectors, technologies, or tasks that are expected to offer better prospects for economic growth or societal welfare than would occur in the absence of such intervention. So it's really state-led development if you think about what the you know, the Japanese and the Chinese and the Koreans have done very successfully um, in the 20th century um, and into the 21st century. Um, but it has a history in the U.S. as well, going back to Alexander Hamilton and the debates about sort of building the railroads and uh, the uh, interstate highway projects of the 1950s, the space program. We have some de facto industrial policy through our defense uh, uh, and, and military spending. So it's really this arena where the government tries to get engaged in the economy um, in a micro level, really um, trying to foster certain industries um, uh, with the perception that those particular industries are going to benefit the nation in some broad way, okay? So, so that's the idea of, uh, of what industrial policy is all about. Um, here's a headline I just pulled. Uh, is industrial policy making a comeback? Uh, this was from the Council on Foreign Relations talking about COVID-19 pandemic and the rise of China. It prompted renewed debate about the U.S.'s government role in shaping the economy. Um, so if it's coming back, why is it, where is it coming back from and where did it go? So let's talk a little bit uh, about that. What's left out of this comment uh, that I pulled off the web, of course, was climate change. Um, and uh, that is really where uh, sort of the backdrop to this conversation, the U.S. just passed uh, about a $500 billion bill that is specifically all about um, uh, several bills, actually, the Infrastructure Bill, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and even the CHIPS bill that's really designed to grow out or build out uh, a massive renewable energy economy um, to specifically to address climate change. So, interestingly enough, they didn't want to talk about that particular initiative. All right, so let's let's think about climate for a minute. I, I specifically didn't start off talking about that, um, but it is the driver for this conversation. And for me, this is like the best picture that really illustrates the, the mess we're in, all right? Um, so this is a, a, a picture 
that goes back about 10,000 years. Um, this is data from Science 2008. It's been updated. It's still pretty much state of the art. Um, and what it shows is the world's average global temperature, right? So if you had temperature stations all over the world all year round and you took those readings and you averaged them, that would be uh, the number that you get. Um, and it's a, it's a good proxy for climate, kind of what our average global temperature is. Now, of course, we didn't have weather stations 10,000 years ago. Scientists have gotten really good proxy data from ice cores and tree rings and pollen samples and um, a, a whole variety of ways that they can assess what the temperature was in a given region over an annual cycle. So you average all that stuff together. Um, and what you see for the last 10,000 years is that humans have been the beneficiary of incredibly stable climate. Um, temperature has varied really very little over 100-year periods, of, uh, and even over 1,000-year periods has you know, gone up maybe a half a degree centigrade, uh, you know, one or two degrees Fahrenheit in either direction over that period of time. Now, this is all of human history, right? 10,000 years ago, that's when people first arrived here in the Hudson Valley um, across the ice bridge from Asia. So the very first inhabitants of this place, that's 10,000 years ago. Move a little bit further, you get into animal husbandry, the first cities in Ur and Babylon, um, and then you go all the way out to the end there, you know, and that's the iPhone, uh, the end of that blue uh, line there, all right? So what you can see is incredibly stable global temperatures until we hit the Industrial Revolution, and then it just shoots up, right? And the question for policy and, and for our futures is how high are we gonna let this thing go and the red line there is how high it could go, um, depending upon what we do. What we probably can do if we get everything right is about that. Um, so holding global temperatures under two degrees C or about four degrees Fahrenheit um, increase over the pre-industrial levels. Um, that's the uh, uh, optimistic but still realistic target. You might have heard of 1.5 degrees as kind of the what we would like to have done, um, but we just got a report earlier this year that says we're going to blow through that um, by 2030 something, and it actually that could actually happen in the next couple of years because we're coming out of uh, in terms of the de decadal cycles. We're coming out of a period called La Nina where there's a lot of uh, heat stored in the Pacific Ocean into an El Nino, where much of that heat gets released in the atmosphere. And the last time that happened, um, over the course of 2014, 15, 16, and 17, the planet actually heated up a quarter of a degree C, or about four degrees, um, I mean, I'm sorry, half a degree Fahrenheit in just three years. So that, it's going to be the hottest year ever next year or the year after, undoubtedly, um, and it could be very hot. So um, get used to that. It's going to be distressing and depressing to see us break through global temperature records yet again over a two- or three-year period. Um, but it doesn't mean game over. I mean, we know that's coming. Um, it means we've just got a lot of work to do to hold it to, to that two-degree Fahrenheit warming. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on what it means to go beyond two degrees. You guys have heard that plenty, so. Um, all right, kind of the industrial policy story around climate change goes back a long ways. Um, and in particular, when I was 18 uh, and a freshman at college, uh, I bought this book called Soft Energy Paths on the left there. Um, and it had just come out, uh, there was a physicist named Amory Lovins who wrote the book. Um, with assistance from his partner, Hunter Lovins. Um, and it, Amory sort of laid out this very compelling story uh, about, at the time it was more about energy security and less about climate change because we didn't really know, I mean, the, we were getting the first inklings of climate change in the late 70s. Um, uh, but sort of arguing that uh, in, in order to unhook from our addiction to fossil fuels, which was damaging from a, a national security perspective, that uh, we needed to engage in very active industrial policy to drive down the costs of solar and wind and take what he called the soft path rather than the hard path of, of nuclear and coal-powered uh, electricity. 
Um, and, and he was really one of the first people to say that this was actually going to be the, the cheapest thing to do. That this wasn't an expensive initiative, that ultimately this was going to be uh, uh, the efficient uh, approach to um, economic development over the long run. Um, Jimmy Carter probably read that book um, and uh, at the time advocated for a, a real sort of, uh, uh, you know, moonshot approach to investing in solar with a goal of 20% solar by 2020, uh, by, by 2000, um, and famously put solar panels on the roof of the White House. Um, and uh, so that story was very much alive in the 70s. Um, but uh, then it really got squashed for about 30 years, um, uh, at least in the United States and significantly around the world. Um, and we'll talk about why in a minute. But I've been very much engaged with this idea since then. I wrote the first edition of my textbook in 1992 um, and had a chapter on uh, promoting clean technology, uh, which um, uh, was very much this kind of industrial policy vision. And I wrote again about it in um, the early 2000s. Um, so what happened um, in 1980 that sort of derailed us from uh, solving the climate crisis much earlier? Um, and it was uh, uh, neoliberalism, which I'm sure you all are familiar with as the concept. Um, but it was sort of the rise of a, of a privatized and, and liberalized ideology, a time in which, uh, at least in America, the economics profession became very distrustful of state intervention and very uh, in, enamored of the idea of market solutions to social problems. Um, and, um, and so there was a lot of people that in the economics profession that were sort of savaging the idea of state-led development um, and industrial policy. And, and the basic story was governments don't know how to pick winners, right? Why would we think the governments would be smart enough to know where to invest um, and much, letter, much better left to the market. Climate change is a problem, yes, said the neoliberal economists, but we're gonna solve it with a market mechanism. So we're either gonna tax pollution um, or we're gonna impose a, a cap and trade system where we cap total pollution uh, even under a shrinking cap, um, but uh, let people trade, trade permits that they buy from the government um, in order to gain some sort of short-run efficiencies. Um, and the basic idea was that economists were really thinking about um, climate change as a negative externality. You, know, you guys are I may be familiar with that term. You know, an, an externality is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a cost or a benefit of a market transaction that's not borne by the consumers or producers. Um, and, and certainly it is an externality in some sense, right? When I drove my car here this morning, um, I burned uh, a, a lot of gasoline um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the social costs that I imposed on the world as a consequence of doing that, you know, the addition to carbon dioxide, I'm not paying for and neither are the oil, industry, oil companies, right? So as a result, I'm consuming too much gasoline um, and so the, the classic economics sort of Response to that is a Pigouvian tax, or as I said, some sort of uh, cap and trade system. Um, but it's sort of a stupid way to think about something as huge as climate change, right? It, it, it's just, it's way more complicated than that. Um, and the problem with those market based solutions, uh, economists were advocating them very aggressively for the last 30 years, is uh, they impose sort of huge costs on consumers um, because you don't have substitutes available, right? So you impose gasoline taxes um, and the idea is, well, that's going to make uh, the dirty technologies more expensive and incentivize investment in the clean technologies. But you're really putting the cart before the horse in some sense because in the meantime, everybody's got to pay really high prices for necessities. Um, and it's going to be a very slow process by which those kind of uh, alternative technologies then emerge and provide opportunities for people to substitute away from those technologies. Uh, and an example would be that in Europe, as you probably know, they've historically had gas prices that were four times as high in the U.S. Um, 
And yet that didn't fundamentally alter the automobile market. It made, you know, people had smaller cars in Europe, but they, they didn't move away from internal combustion engines um, because there just, there was no private sector sort of drive into that space. Uh, people just live with higher prices. So um, it's a flawed mechanism for thinking about something as fundamental as climate change. And really it's a design problem. Um, uh, that that's the way we should think about it. You can talk about path-dependent technology, right? So we've, we've gone down a path of investment in fossil fuels. We're locked in. You know, everybody needs it. Um, we've got systems, you know, whole economic systems that are integrated around that idea. We've got freeways and, you, you know, transport systems, and everything is sort of working to support uh, a, a, and reinforce an addiction to that fossil fuel system. So if you want to get off of it, you've got to build an alternate pathway. Um, and if you do that, and you do it right, um, uh, uh, and as you start to build out those alternative systems, and uh, ideally you're gonna start to gain cost reductions through economies of scale, and learning by doing, and network externalities, and the costs of those alternatives are gonna start to fall. Um, and then at some point, you know, you've got, you've built out that alternative energy system and then you can make the transition, right? Um, and that is kind of the alternative economic paradigm that is the right one um, that I've been talking about for a long time and now everybody's come around to my viewpoint, which I'm happy about. Um, so let me tell you, you know, we've talked about sort of the grim news about climate change. Let me tell you about some good thing about your future, okay? Um, so sometime in your lifetime, the world will be essentially 60% powered by cheap, abundant solar energy combined with storage systems like batteries, you know, stuff we've got in our phones, but also a conversion of solar power um, and wind power to uh, things like hydrogen and liquid fuels. Um, so we'll create, we'll figure out ways to take that solar energy produce electricity and then turn it into things that we can store, okay? This is coming uh, just by virtue of the fundamental economics. Um, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, once this happens, there's a bunch of good things that are gonna happen as a result. First, it will solve climate change. Where on that, that scale is problematic, right? Uh, but we're gonna get there. We will get there in the next few decades. Um, it will clean the air in cities, and this is really why the Chinese have largely embraced uh, renewable energy plus electric vehicles, because uh, you know, as recently as five or 10 years ago, millions of Chinese people were dying every year as a consequence of exposure to really bad urban air pollution. Uh, they've been made some big progress as a result of this move towards electric vehicles. Um, uh, so as we get coal-fired power plants shut down and gas-fired cars, or gasoline-powered cars shut down, that's really gonna clean up the air. Um, it's gonna end energy poverty, right? So we've still got a couple billion people around the world who don't have access to reliable energy or electricity. Um, that may sound romantic, but you know, just try it for three days um, and see how that feels. Um, it's very, uh, it's liberating, right, to have access to, to, to energy. That will come, and then also, you know, I, in my mind, one of the most important features is that it's going to break the back of the sort of corruption that uh, sort of inherently uh, accumulates around the fossil fuel sector, right? Because um, uh, our energy technologies of the 20th century were, you know, uh, were, were, were almost natural monopolies, right? There's very few people in the world who have kind of gained access to control over coal, oil, utilities, transmission lines, and, and that's really generated a concentration of wealth and power that um, we've seen massive corruption and destruction from. So the war in Ukraine, fully brought to you by the fossil fuel industry, right? Um, the fact that one man has really, you know, monopolized control over hundreds of billions of dollars of fossil fuel revenue allows him to prosecute a war. But uh, the corruption is, evident in many countries around the world, including in the United States, where the reason that we are 30 years late 
um, in addressing the climate change can be traced directly to the political influence of the fossil fuel industry. Um, so solar is inherently a democratic technology, it's a democratizing technology, um, and it's gonna create a different world in terms of our relationship to energy. So all that good stuff is coming uh, really courtesy of industrial policy. Um, there was pushback against industrial policy in the US and in other places through the kind of Washington consensus and sort of the rise of neoliberal economics, but it still went on. And the US had its own version of that. There were a variety of renewable energy subsidies. Um, in the early 2000s, the Germans got into this in a big way with their energy vine policies, specifically about ensuring that Germany was gonna be a leader in solar energy. Um, uh, the Danes have been doing this in wind power. There's a reason that Vestas is a Danish company. It's one of the biggest turbine manufacturers in the world. Um, and then the Chinese really made a commitment in about 2008 or 9 or 10 to uh, really seek to dominate um, in solar um, and electric vehicle technology. Um, so beginning um, in those eras, we really saw, uh, um, you know, globally sort of continued engagement with this, and it's really worked. I mean, solar prices have fallen about 10% a year since the late 70s, and I'll blow up just that last little bit there. You can see they're continuing to go down, and there's no reason to think they're, they're stopping, right? We, we're, we're still essentially using the technology that was developed for the space age in terms of silicon um, solar photovoltaics, and there's lots of new technology that um, is in incubation right now that will allow us to really explore the frontiers of, of, of solar energy. Um, and it's just ridiculously cheap even now, right? So, um, uh, do I have that up? Next slide, let me see if I, what I've got. Um, yeah, you can see that um, if you look at utility scale solar, um, and uh, onshore wind, it was really about 2018 or 19 globally that the cost curves really crossed and um, both wind and solar became cheaper than the cheapest fossil fuels, which would be a new natural gas plant. So if you look at Western US sort of unregulated markets, um, fossil fuel, cheap, the cheapest fossil fuels will come in about four cents a kilowatt hour and the cheapest wind, solar, battery, storage combinations that give you reliable power will come in at two cents a kilowatt hour. We're getting 1.1 cent kilowatt hour sort of bids in the Middle East. So the, the, the wholesale generating cost of solar is now just well below fossil fuels um, and essentially all new electricity generating capacity globally that's not heavily subsidized is wind or solar. Um, here in the U.S. even, I think we had about 80% of new generating capacity that was built last year was renewables. Um, so we kind of solved the new construction problem. We still have subsidies for coal and other things that are problematic, but in, it's in terms of market economics, we're, we've crossed that threshold where um, uh, investors are not interested in conventional technologies unless they, they can be provided with really high subsidies. Um, uh, let me just go, what was that? Get to that. And on the vehicle side, you know, very similar story, right? We've seen similar sort of reduction in prices for batteries. Um, electric vehicle prices are coming down. There was a piece yesterday about massive price wars in China. The Shanghai Auto Show is all about electric vehicles. Everybody's committed to a transition to close to 100% electric by 2035. Um, and so these are really powerful policy stories. It's a, it's a huge policy win. It's late in coming. It could have happened 20 years earlier. But the fact that we are in a position to solve the climate change and keep it under 2 degrees C, we can really thank Jimmy Carter um, and the sort of world of people around him who kept that dream alive in terms of US com commitments, even in tough times, um, and, um, uh, and then of course globally. So here's where we've gotta go. Um, you can see that wind, solar's only now about 3%, even though it's been growing fast. Um, wind's up to about 9%. We need to get, depending upon you know, 
uh, our target somewhere between 50 and 95 percent within 30 years. That's the, the shift that we have to make to stabilize the climate. Um, that seems like impossible, um, but it's not. Um, you can just actually take a look at what's happened to coal since 2000. It's gone from 50% down to 20%, and it's continuing to, to go fast towards zero. So rapid energy transitions are possible. They're complicated, um, but they are possible. What humans are trying to do now is the biggest thing we have ever done. This is bigger than World War II. It's bigger than the pyramids. It's bigger than anything. Um, trying to transition the entire global energy system away from fossil fuels in 30 years. But it's really now underway all over the world. So in the US, we've got um, a lot of federal policy that happened last year. Um, We've got uh, very active state policy in California, Oregon, Washington, Massachusetts, New York, other places. Um, and I'll talk about the New York case in a minute. Um, the EU, you know, the Russian invasion has uh, uh, doubled down on the EU's commitment to a renewable energy transition as they, you know, going back to Amory Lovin's vision of energy insecurity, that's what they have in spades. So they realize, you know, they have a pathway now to uh, get off of Russian oil and gas um, with some kind of, of rapid decarbonization policy. And again, China is uh, absolutely committed to uh, this space as well. Um, even while they continue to license coal plants, um, they are you know, by far the global leader in terms of installed capacity for renewables. Um, and this may be the last burst of kind of coal interest. Um, and then it's also happening in lots of other places. So um, I'm teaching an energy policy class this year, and for the last 30 years, whenever I teach this class, it's always been, well, here's what we should do, right? And now I can talk about what we are doing, and it's really kind of, uh, it is an exciting time, right? Because uh, attention has turned um, where it should be. Um, always have to think about speed here, though, because um, you know, we, we, we talk about um, in our sort of justice work uh, that, that urgency is one of the habits of white supremacy, right? Um, and it, people get steamrolled um, uh, under sort of the mantra of urgency. Um, and uh, in this case, we really do have some urgency, right? But we need to take that lesson to heart and, and recognize that there could be a lot of injustice um, uh, the, the emerging from an in unjust transition, but on the other hand, there could be a lot of justice that comes out of a just transition. And so we need to think about both the pollution and exploitation of labor and communities that can happen um, in the switch from fossil fuels to renewables and, and storage. Um, uh, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, we need to ensure that the benefits from the transition uh, go to low-income and frontline and, and marginalized communities in the transition. So um, this is a big part of the dialogue in uh, places where uh, it can be, um, and we need to push that very, very far. Okay, so um, what has happened in the U.S.? Um, I've got the 30-year stall here um, in... I, re I remember when I first heard about global warming, it was, it was 1981, so I was a junior in college, and I was part of an anti-nuclear group, um, and we, we had our meeting, there was a guy named Al L, who was like 35 or something, and had long blonde hair and a guitar, and for some reason he was still coming to student group meetings, one of those guys that was hanging around uh, too long at college, um, but he showed up, and I remember he was ashen-faced, and just looked really scared, and he said, you know, the, the, the government scientists have, have proved it. There's this thing called the greenhouse effect, and we're all going to die. Um, and we were like, oh, that's just Al. You know, whatever. He's just going on about some conspiracy theory thing. Um, but he was right, you know. Um, and then about six years later, we kind of had the official acceptance by the scientific community that stuff was happening. And then in 1992, um, under President George W. Bush, H.W., no W., H.W., the first George Bush. Um, uh, 
the U.S. actually signed and, and ratified a U.N. convention on climate change, the UNFCCC. Um, and it was actually voted in favor of 95 to 0 in the U.S. Senate, ratification of that treaty. Impossible to imagine now, right? But it, it was a different world, um, and it was before the polarization that has so kind of uh, torn us apart, right, since then. Um, but since then, the, the federal government really has done nothing explicitly on climate, like zero in 30 years. Um, there was, uh, California's taken a leadership role. There was an attempt under the Obama administration to put together a cap and trade, but it fell apart. Um, Obama did accelerate the, the kind of the, the industrial policy piece under the guise of the Recovery Act of 2009. So we had a burst of, of clean energy subsidies that emerged at that time, which were helpful. Um, and um, then the next big move really came from New York, um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, with the Community Leadership and Climate Protection Act, um, which is very ambitious, 70% uh, renewable energy by 2030, that's seven years from now, 100% emission-free by 2040, um, and then finally, um, the Democrats really embraced this idea of clean technology promotion um, in the, uh, in the infrastructure, inf infrastructure um, Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill this year. And it's kind of interesting that, that there ha we haven't really even seen much of a peep of the critique of industrial policy that was so dominant in the 80s and 90s. There's very few people getting up and saying, well, government shouldn't do this, they can't pick winners. Um, and I think there's two reasons for that. One is that the Democrats have moved to the left economically, um, and climate change has really freaked out everybody. And so there's really no opposition within the Democratic Party to this kind of industrial policy, at least in principle. Um, and then the Republicans have just abdicated on economics. I mean, they just don't talk about it anymore um, because they're so obsessed with culture war stuff that they just don't, you know, you anticipate that someone from the middle right would sort of have some sort of substantive challenge to to this, but it's been more about kind of a knee-jerk reaction rather than a kind of intellectually interesting argument about why the government shouldn't be doing this. So um, I think industrial policy is the order of the day, um, and I don't see kind of a neoliberal blowback coming at this particular piece of it. Um, and so let, let's step back and, and say, okay, what, having framed that and we've got this legislation, what is it actually supposed to do? How does it get us to where we want to be in terms of climate change? And here are the four things you have to do to, to stabilize the climate. The first thing is you've got to do is you've got to build lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of renewable energy and storage. Um, because if you think about what you're doing is you're electrifying everything, which was actually the second step. Uh, so we're going to have electric vehicles, we're going to get rid of, you know, uh, um, fuel oil heating systems, and we're going to get rid of um, propane heating systems and natural gas heating systems. So we're going to heat all our buildings with electricity, we're going to drive our cars on electricity, we're going to use electricity for industrial purposes. So we need actually double the amount of electricity generation that we're getting because we're going to need more of it, not less of it. Um, so you've got to build lots of renewables, and then you've got to go through and electrify everything. Um, and so, for example, over the last couple of years, I have electrified my heating systems in the property that I own. I had one building that was on uh, natural gas, uh, propane, and another building that was on fuel oil, and we installed you know, heat pumps, and now we're nice and warm, and we're using pretty clean energy in upstate New York, uh, electricity to power that instead of emitting fossil fuels. Um, and um, haven't got the electric vehicle yet, got the, the um, plug-in hybrid, so at least the first 15 miles is electric, um, but after that it's gas. So those are the first two steps. We have to do that with everything. Um, 
Then find specialized solutions for hard to decarbonize sectors like concrete steel, aviation, so those are some harder ones to crack. Um, and then finally, suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and you've probably heard of regenerative agriculture and techniques to get carbon into the soil, um, as well as the potential for um, uh, sort of industrial methods of carbon capture and sequestration. But this is really what the policy is trying to achieve. And um, I want to give you one case study, so I'll end up on that. And, and that is the, uh, uh, what, what's happening here in New York State. Um, and I love this picture because it gives you a sense of sort of how fast um, energy transitions can happen. Um, and this was also in New York, so it's nice to illustrate that. So on the left, you've got Easter morning, uh, 1900, 5th Avenue. There is one automobile in that picture that is circled in red. Um, 13 years later, same day, there is one horse somewhere in there. All right. Um, and you guys are obviously familiar with very rapid, yes, like, you know, where's Waldo, right? You're, you're familiar with very rapid technology um, uh, disruption because obviously when you were born there was no such thing as smartphones and now three billion people on the planet have got, you know, the power of the internet in their pocket. Um, so you know that this stuff can happen fast. Um, what's different about energy is you've got to, it takes up a lot of, it's, it's, it's an industrial project uh, on a pretty massive scale. Um, so let's look at um, what's happening in particular with offshore wind in New York, because it's, a, it's, a it's actually really interesting. Usually states don't really have the capacity to do industrial policy, because they're, they're too small, right? But New York is big enough to be able to do that. Um, and so again, uh, we've got this 2019 law passed that with targets, um, including 100% uh, zero emission electricity by 2040, and in particular, a mandate that New York was going to build 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. That's, enough, that's about s the equivalent of six big nuclear power plants of power. So it, it, that's enough power to, to power about five million homes, kind of half the size of New York City. Um, it's a huge amount of electricity. Um, so, um, and it's a major, major, major industrial project. Um, so, uh, billions of dollars in infrastructure, and this is 30% of New York's electricity load, about half of New York City's load. These are gargantuan things. You can take a look at how big they are relative to the uh, Empire State Building. So the, the, the turbines they're going to put up are, are at least as big as the ones on the far right there. Um, and um, in order to get there, um, you've got to build a lot of stuff, and you've got to hire a lot of people, and you've got to build a lot of transmission lines. But we're not stopping there, right, in terms of industrial development. Um, that's just New York. So all of the East Coast states combined now have 50 megawatts, uh, 50 gigawatts, excuse me, 50,000 megawatts uh, planned um, by 2035. So that's the equivalent of about 30 big nuclear power plants. Um, and uh, the federal offshore goals, as part of the Biden vision and plan, is 110,000 gigawatts by 2050. So that's, again, the equivalent of, let's say, 80 really big nuclear power plants. Um, you know, as a country, we just haven't built that much stuff in that short a time in a long time, right? Since the 70s, we haven't really built, had any kind of infrastructure push. Um, and this is just, it's a very different story than uh, sort of Americans have experienced um, since really the 60s and, and early 70s. Um, okay, to get there, um, uh, they're envisioning um, uh, a lot of manufacturing 
um, uh, of, of the towers and the blades and the, the bolts and the, the cables and all that stuff uh, happening in the Hudson Valley. Um, and in particular uh, at the Port of Coimans and uh, or the Port of Albany, so two ports up the Hudson River. Um, you need uh, lots of electricians, obviously, to do all of that renovation. Um, um, and, uh, and then a lot of jobs in the ports themselves, right, which will be off Long Island. Um, uh, and the vision here is, you know, how do you ensure that, you know, those jobs are going, are benefiting, you know, low income and, and marginalized communities. And so there's a lot of stakeholder engagement involved in this process, a lot of, of bringing in community groups, trying to figure out where to put the training facilities, um, um, and, and how is all this getting paid for, okay? Well, the way it's getting paid for is really by the developers. Um, so the developers come in with a bid for power, um, and, um, They've got to agree, uh, as part of their bid, to invest tens, thirties, hundreds of millions of dollars in these port facilities, get partners to invest in these manufacturing facilities, um, provide funding for training. Now, ultimately, that money's gonna come out of our pockets as ratepayers, right? Um, because the way that those developers are gonna pay for it is they're gonna build the turbines, they're gonna get paid for the electricity, right? Um, and out of the money that they're getting paid for the electricity, they're setting aside chunks of it for these economic development activities, right? Um, so it's not government using tax dollars per se for this industrial policy, it's actually using uh, money that is coming ultimately from ratepayers. Um, uh, so it's kind of a hidden tax, if you will, on your electricity bill. Um, that's okay because the power's gonna be cheap, right? Um, so it's not like people's bills are gonna go up. In fact, they're gonna go down. Um, but uh, they're not gonna go down as much as they would if we weren't also paying for all of that economic development, okay? But that's really the process. That's where the money's coming from to uh, enable the build out of this infrastructure to then support the growth uh, of, of these opportunities. Um, so, you know, here's the phases of, you know, uh, um, Phase one is marquee investments in blades, cables, ports, um, and, then, and then on out. A um, lot of technical working groups, a lot of consulting, environmental I impacts, fisheries, maritime, commerce, uh, et cetera, you know, that's got to go on to coordinate all this stuff and, uh, again, try and get the benefits flowing to environmental justice communities. And in particular, what was unique about New York State law, I didn't mention this, was a requirement that 30% of the benefits associated with the development of green renewable energy have to go to what are designated as disadvantaged communities. So they actually went through a process of designating census tracts that are supposed to receive at least 30% of the total benefits. So there is a guiding environmental justice dimension behind the policy. Um, workforce training, transmission planning is huge. Um, you can kind of see uh, what's going on. The nice thing about offshore wind is you, you, know, you don't have to disrupt a lot of you know, land-based communities with transmission lines. You can bring a lot of it in from the ocean. Um, um, but there is still you know, a lot of issues related to building out the transmission system uh, and reorienting it away from pulling power down from the upstate. And also, downstate really produces a lot of electricity with really dirty sources, coal and natural gas. So we're gonna shut all those down as the, um, 
as the clean energy comes online. Okay, I want to leave, save a little time for, for questions. Um, I can talk a little bit about our graduate programs at the end, but um, I guess the, the, the bottom line here is that we are, uh, industrial policy and climate policy are now firmly intertwined. It is the way forward. Um, there's competition. The Europeans are unhappy about the Buy American provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. The Americans are unhappy about the Chinese subsidizing their solar panels. So there's going to be a lot of trade issues that are going to come. But in, in my mind, someone wrote about this, not my original thought, what we're really seeing is an is a, is a, is a industrial policy war as various jurisdictions are trying to grab the pieces of this and develop uh, real leadership in this space. Um, and in particular, New York is trying to get the blade and turbine tower production facilities located in New York, not in Virginia, not in Rhode Island. So even within the U.S. states, there's going to be jurisdictional sort of competition to, to use this as a lever for, for economic development. Um, so that's, that's the story. Um, I, you know, I think it's ultimately an optimistic story. There's a lot of obstacles, but uh, exciting time to, to sort of learn about this stuff and get involved in it. There's huge amounts of work to be done. Um, nuclear, uh, at the level of sort of the big gigawatt plants, is just hideously expensive. Um, you know, 25 cents a kilowatt hour or something like that. We have nuclear plants in New York that we're subsidizing to keep open because they, even on their operating cost basis, they lose money. So it's eight or nine cents a kilowatt hour and, you know, renewables are coming in at three or four cents. Um, we shouldn't shut our existing nuclear plant fleet down because it's, they're built and it's giving us carbon-free energy. Um, there is a push um, to try and develop small-scale nuclear plants. Uh, and part of the reason that nuclear is such a, so expensive or, and a very high risk so that private investors don't want to touch it is, you know, they're, they're just hideously expensive. They're 10, 12, 15 billion dollars for a plant. Um, and, and you also have to envision that for 40 years, people are going to want to buy that power, right? You know, because that's, so you have to have a captive market to feed into that. And in a world of distributed energy, that's just no, no bets there. So um, you do see them still being built, you know, where you've got uh, states who are willing to subsidize them, like France or, or China or Korea, um, but just not the solution. People are working on, like, um, 100 megawatt plants, you know, sort of a tenth the size of the gigawatt plants um, that are supposed to be much safer and, you know, still going to have waste issues, but uh, those are, will come online, the first ones will come online in maybe 2029 or 2030. So people are betting on them to really help us develop some base load ca capacity, maybe, um, if they work out. Um, there was one just permitted for a experimental facility in 2029 in Idaho. Um, but it, it's a solution for the 2030s, if, if, if at all. The other really cool baseload technology um, that could emerge in the 2030s is, um, uh, is uh, geothermal electricity production, which essentially builds on fracking technology. So you, you drill down, you frack the rock at a you know, kilometer down where it's really hot, then you push water through it and you get steam that drives turbines. So that also is a really interesting kind of base load technology option. You drill down and then you frack out like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so BARD is, uh, does a lot of our heating and cooling with geothermal, but that's, that's for heating and cooling. I'm talking about for electricity production, and this would be where you, you dig deep and you get basically steam driving turbines um, as a way to, you know, really re create sort of uh, megawatt scale electricity production. The one problem with that one is it causes 
earthquakes. Mild earthquakes so far, but <laughs> yeah. Yes, I mean, it's complicated. Um, there's some positives, there's some negatives. So it's really a question of mitigating where possible and accepting some loss and trying to get as many benefits as you can. But yeah, I'd urge you to go to the NYSERDA offshore wind site and it's just gobs of information about their thinking about that. Um, one of the issues is noise um, uh, during construction. And so trying to you know, do construction at a time when is not in breeding season or when they're not around. Um, they're looking at floating offshore wind um, for deep sea offshore wind right now with really interesting technology where you don't have to drive piles into the, into the ocean floor. Um, so yeah, it's complicated. But it's not, it's not devastating. It's not like, no one anticipates that it's gonna sort of wipe out species or anything like that. It's, it does have negative impacts but also positive impacts in terms of habitat. Yeah. Um, I don't think so because the result is that it's driving down costs and prices. So that's what's exciting about, you know, uh, the solar revolution, right, is that, you know, it, people all over the world in low-income and poor countries are gonna get access to cheap solar panels um, um, and, uh, and make it possible that you don't have to be connected to the grid um, in order to have the benefits of electricity. I mean, you know, the people who are leading it are gonna get the, the benefits of the, you know, of the manufacturing, but yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how do I think about all the impacts Yeah. Yeah, so what you're doing is you're thinking, okay, what are the pathways to the future? Well, you could have a, 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 a future that was reliant on fossil fuels, and that would require you to build pipelines and, um, you know, manufacture stuff and, um, drill, right? Or you have a renewable future where you build windmills and solar, right? So it's not like you're, either way, you're gonna build a lot of stuff and use a lot of steel. And, you know, uh, in the case of renewables, you won't be causing um, uh, oil spills and, you know, pumping gases in the atmosphere. So that's why you would pursue a, re a renewable pathway. Um, People have looked at kind of what is the relative mining burden, for example, of, uh, of a renewable future versus a fossil fuel future. And um, the, the real advantage of renewables, think about fossil fuels, how do you do that? Well, you dig up some stuff, you transport it, you burn it, right? And you have to do that every day, right? You dig up some stuff, you transport it, you burn it, you have to do that every day. With renewables, you dig up some stuff, you manufacture some stuff, and then you're done, right? Bill McKibben has a quote that there's something like 40% of global shipping is just moving oil and coal around. 40% of the entire global ocean shipping is just moving oil and coal around. Um, if you look at the mining burden, um, it's about how much uh, stuff you actually have to pull out of the ground. It's about 1% the renewable future versus the um, uh, fossil fuel future. You have to move more earth to get to that stuff, so it's more like a 20% trade-off. So you, in terms of the land sort of impacted, it's about 20% in the renewable space versus the um, fossil fuel space. So th there is pollution, there will be exploitation of communities, and you know we need to minimize all that stuff, but it's, a, it's essentially moving towards a circular economy, right? Batteries in particular, if we can figure out how to recycle them, um, are, are inherently s circular because they have valuable metals in them. Um, so whereas with the fossil fuel economy, you're, you know, waste, you know, take, make waste, right? That's the model versus the renewable system, which is, you know, inherently more circular. Other questions?
Yeah. Um, not yet, because we've got a continental shelf on this side, so it's pretty shallow. Um, but in the east, on the west side, it's a uh, trench, so it's pretty deep. So you don't really have the resource out there, which is why people are looking at floating uh, offshore wind um, uh, as a kind of an alternative to that. Any other questions? We had a lot of student questions, that's great, so. So when you do one industrial product, you do need a producer that can produce the, the component first. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm hearing both parts in, in your quote. I'm hearing that there, there can be public roles for the government that can come into play. And then actually industry that is like behind the scenes. The same thing with, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's an important buzzy story that you're, you're telling, but do you feel that policy matters for the kinds of critical supplies and industrial skills that are core of the entire food supply? So, yes, technology seems to be there and available, but, but do you see that that kind of scale that we associate with, like, you know, fuel transmission, big highways that yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think the issue is not um, uh, fiscal so much because there's a lot of money to be made. I mean, in some ways, what happened is this is really not so much about. Well, there is. I mean, there is infrastructure around um, transmission lines and whatnot, um, charging stations, um, but a lot of it is competitive provision of things that people want, um, and so. Uh, there's a lot of private investment capital that is sort of sitting on the sidelines ready to jump in. Um, and if you just think about solar power, right? I mean, it, it's, it's just dirt cheap. And so if you can find a place to site it and have access to a transmission line, you're gonna make a lot of money. Um, so it's more, I think the obstacles are more, are less around capital. I think there's plenty of capital that's ready to move into the space. Um, but it's around uh, how do you enable that, that capital to get in there um, especially in the face of, uh, you know, uh, skilled worker shortages, uh, siting opposition. Uh, that's probably, in the U.S., probably the biggest obstacle is that there's a lot of people that want renewable energy, but they don't want it anywhere close to them. Um, and so finding, you know, sort of overcoming local community opposition to wind, solar, um, transmission, those are probably the bigger obstacles. I, I think the money is there um, because there's, there's, you can definitely make a lot of money in this space as soon as those things, because the heavy lifting by government was already done, right? I mean, essentially, it's been for the last 40 years that they've been making the, 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 the R&D investments um, to drive down the prices, um, and now, the, the private sector is pretty poised to take over, um, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, like uh, you know, use storage type places or, or yeah, no, uh, yeah. Um, the economics of rooftop or distributed solar aren't quite there yet to sort of have the market, you know, that excited about them. Um, although really, it, it's, it's got more to do with the, with the grid and transmission systems. Um, and, um, but those costs are coming down and this is where you kind of get to the horse and buggy story, right? At some point, it's going to be cheaper to um, put solar panels on your commercial building 
um, and put in a battery storage system than it is to buy power from the grid. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's to some extent that's true. Yeah, I mean, depending on what's going on in those areas. But, um, but as soon as it's cheaper to even pay sort of a chunk of your electricity, if you can put up your panels, store the power so that you've got, you know, enough to keep you going, you know, 24-7, um, and you don't, right now you have to get permission from the utility, right? So there's this monopoly sort of entity that can say no to you about your solar installation, and, and they will because it really threatens their business model, right? Um, but as soon as there's a situation where you don't need their permission um, and you can just, you know, have a little microgrid, you know, that's powering some significant portion of your operation, that's where you could begin to, to see very rapid transition that could be quite challenging for the, for the for grid stability and all of that stuff as people start to defect from uh, from the utilities and start generating their own power locally and that's that I think that's coming um, pretty soon so yeah that's another disruptive element yeah Um, in terms of policy, um, yep. Well, I would say um, it's a great place to work. So you know, if you want, if you want an exciting and interesting career, um, you know, get involved in this energy transition, and you can do it. You know, from the policy side, you can do it from the business side, you can do it from you know, all, all sorts of different angles. Um, so uh, I recognize it as a, as a very rapidly growing sector where there's really interesting opportunities to solve some of these problems from a community advocacy perspective, whatever. Um, and of course, you know, as a citizen, you know, you want to be supportive of you know, a just transition, a, a rapid just transition, right? So support, you know, politicians who can do this stuff. Um, you know, I, I think of it typically in sort of the personal, professional, and political realms, you know. Um, and um, yeah, so consumer investing, you know, all of your decisions can really be part of this sort of system transformation. I'm going to wrap it now because I'd like to talk a little bit about our graduate program. So thank you. I should say thank you. Thank you all for being here. So. Okay, let me make a quick, um, uh, a quick advertisement. Um, two things. One is um, we have started, um, whoop, what is going on there? Why can't I get that one out? We've started, um, we're offering some new courses at Bard around this idea of social enterprise and leading change. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm gonna put in a plug for a fall course um, in social entrepreneurship that uh, some of you have taken. Um, and so this is a course that will be available to you guys uh, at registration time. So if you've ever wanted to start at your own business or start your own nonprofit or explore that as an idea, um, it's a, a great course. Um, it's part of the OSIN um, system. So the way the structure of the course is there's a global classroom. So once um, a week you meet uh, you know, on Zoom with students from Kyrgyzstan and you know, Bangladesh and Colombia. But once a week, you've got a teacher, one of our MBA grads, who works with you on your business ideas. And you work on teams. Um, and it's a huge amount of fun. Nathan did it. Uh, and anybody else in this class has done it? But he also just competed in the Hudson Valley uh, business competition. So they took their idea and they, they went and pitched it uh, out more broadly. Um, so it's a really cool course. It's part of a, this broader certificate in social enterprise and leading change. Um, and there's three courses involved in that. But the, the basic idea is 
it's a set of courses that let you kind of learn essentially business skills, but directed towards um, uh, social good, right? How do you how do you build businesses or nonprofit organizations that are have to make money, of course, but that are ultimately in business to try and solve social and environmental problems? Um, and you know, if you think about how do how do we solve climate change or uh, you know, gender inequity or whatever. In my mind, there's three ways to do that, right? You can change the rules, and we've been talking about policy and how important policy has been. Um, you can change minds, that's education. But the third piece is changing the game, because around climate, at the end of the day, no matter how many minds we change, and no matter how many rules we change, we need new kinds of businesses, right, that are figuring out how to get that done, right? How do we get our energy and get the lights and get our food in ways that radically reduce environmental pollution, 80, 90%, but that also treat workers and communities and suppliers with justice and with respect because you can't have an ecologically engaged company that's not all socially, socially responsible. So do look for this. I think it's under the ES or EUS environmental studies listing. It, I think it might be cross-listed with, I think it's cross-listed with econ, but I don't know where it shows up in the catalog. So love to have you in the course in the fall. Um, and there you can learn about the other courses. And the other thing I just mentioned in passing is we do offer at BART a four plus one in, um, how do I get that done? There we go. Uh, four plus one in environmental policy and climate science and policy. Um, so it's one of the few places in the world, uh, liberal arts colleges, where you can get a master's degree in this space with just one extra year. Um, essentially what happens is you start taking our master's courses as juniors and seniors, um, so, and you get to double dip on those. So they count both towards your undergraduate degree and your master's degree. Um, and then in the final year, the fifth year with us, you do a year long internship and take some more courses. But your Sprodge kind of counts as your master's thesis. So it's a pretty sweet deal if you want to get a master's degree uh, with not much additional expense. Um, and it's a good way to get into this space, obviously, around climate and clean energy. So glad to talk more with any of you if you would like to learn more about that. End of advertisement. So. Okay, thank you.